All right, well, we're here today at kind of a roundtable discussion, something we're hoping to maybe do more of, and we've got some uh, charter boat guys here, some big lake fishermen. Let's just start, just kind of introduce yourself. We'll start with you, Mark. Just kind of tell us a little bit of your kind of fishing resume, how long you've been charter boat captaining, just a little bit about yourself. All right, well, I kind of grew up in the industry and such. My uh, father was chartering back in the late 70s and early 80s, so I was his first mate. I was autopilot when he didn't have autopilot back then, of course. And then, of course, became a mate and just kind of evolved. And then, you know, once got out, decided, hey, this is fun. And it's a fun way to feed the addiction since the uh, fishery is so awesome. So we started uh, chartering back in the uh, 2005, I believe, is when we actually started. So been going strong ever since and just uh, enjoying the fishery as a whole. And what put, you're out of Ludington, yep, typically? Out of, typically out of Ludington, but uh, in the springtime we'll go down to St. Joe's, take advantage of that phenomenal fishery down there, the coho and the lake trout that are down there. It's just amazing. Okay. And Adam, what's your story? How long have you been doing this? So I worked as a mate off and on since, I don't know, I was probably 18, 19 years old when I started doing it. Um, my family never big lake fished, so I, hmm. I never, I had a couple times where I went and that I started going and that was it. And so then, so that was probably like the early 2000s and I've had my captain's license now for about 10 years. Okay. And, uh, you know, we fish primarily Ludington. We don't travel very much and... And that's where that's where we're at. But uh, we fish uh, from April all the way into October. And you do a lot of the tournaments then too, or uh, we do some local ones. Okay. Um, Ludington. Well, we've done Manistee off and on. Um, okay. But for the most part, I uh, I have a production company, so I work. Do you have a real job too? Yeah. <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it a real job. But, uh, I don't want people to get a bad impression. Right? <laughs> but no. So I I do a lot of um, audio, video, lighting tech stuff okay uh, on the weekends so most of the time tournament weekends it's pretty gotcha. hard for me to take that off okay and from further down south from pentwater brent tell me a little bit about your background well kind of goes all the way back i guess before i even knew i was on the lake i'd sit on mom's lap and drive the boat while yeah. dad was fishing and i guess i about put him over the back one day i decided to reach up and push the throttle down <laughs> while i was sitting on mom's lap so it started way back um i started first mating so I actually got into it with dad for sure. Okay. You know, he got me started. Then um, started first mating uh, part-time for my band director from nice. school. Okay. Uh, and then that led to working for other guys in town. And then I guess when I was 20, I decided to buy a boat, hmm. get my license. And that was 26 years ago. 26 years. Now we have uh, uh, two full-time boats. My son started running um, our second boat five years ago. Okay. And... Uh, then we are adding a smaller boat this year that we hope to start something down in Florida. Wow. Do some winter fishing down there. So you're, but you're running two full-time charter two boats. Two full-time, and then we're going to have a small boat this year, like a 26-footer, um, to do small groups. So okay. So all three of them will be in Pentwater um, at City Marina. And you, you fish down south, too, quite a bit, too, right? I'll start down in, uh, uh, in New Buffalo with one boat in early April. Then we'll go to Michigan City, charter out of there for a week and a half, do two, two weekend tournaments there. And then uh, we'll move to St. Joe for, from like right after the uh, first weekend of May till middle of May. Okay. And uh, we'll do their big tournament and then charter during the week there. Okay. And then, then our other boat will be in Pentwater starting in April. And uh, Trevor will be fishing either here on that or he'll be down helping me gotcha. down south. So. Okay. Well, but, I figured we'd start off with something just kind of on the positive side. Some, you know, just to hear from from each of you what are some things you're kind of excited about with the the I mean, we're talking primarily uh lake michigan here obviously but uh what are you kind of excited about with the fishery that you've seen maybe a trend over the last couple of years something that you're kind of really excited about well i would say it's the great mixed bag that we have out there um right now you can get numbers uh of different fish your coho your steelhead your lake trout uh lake trout fishery is you know really phenomenal out there and when the big kings show up well then you're going to get those big guys and like they did here in ludington we set a new state record this year so you know that's awesome to get those big guys but you know it's kind of a small window to get them so you always have that mixed bag to go offshore and catch those fishery or those fish for the fishery so i like the idea of the mixed bag and the fact that you can go for different things you can actually offer your clients that hey do you want to go for a trophy or do you want to you know get those good table fare fish which you know the lake trout when i started you would only smoke them or you'd boil them and they were like oh don't don't do lake trout but now you can grill them and they're really actually tasty for that uh you know fact so i like the fact that you have that mixed bag out there that good mixed bag fishery i think uh you know really the, over the last couple of years 
um, really probably over the last decade, we've really seen a return of the bait and, and we're, you know, I, I'm sure we have better electronics than we had 10 years ago, but at the same point, we're con- more consistently marking bait. We're seeing bait around the Harbor almost all the time. And, and there was a time where, uh, that wasn't the case. Um, you, you know, 20 years ago, that it was unbelievable the amount of bait in the lake and, and there definitely was a decline and, you know, they made some good management choices, I think, um, as far as, uh, lowering the plant numbers and, and kind of letting that bait recover. But to me, I, I feel like the bait's recovered. I, I mean, Brent and I have fished in the, in the fall before right next to each other, and both of us mark bait for miles and miles and miles. And it's really good to see that again. You know, so I think that we're – I think we're beyond that point um, nice of, fish. you know, keeping the plants low. I think it, it's time to, to ramp it back up a little bit at least, you know, Dandy. don't go crazy. but. Up. Ease but ease it back, it back in and yeah. keep an eye on it and and uh Very fun. which should mean more kings which i think is what most people want so so kind of same as mark the uh it's nice that like typically up here in june we can have some tough fishing last year in june we caught a fair amount of coho which has to be a direct result from them spreading the coho up the shoreline we're planting coho up here this way now and we used to never get like down south, we caught all these young coho. Well, you didn't see them up here, and now we're seeing them up here in late May and June. Where if we don't have the kings to catch, we uh, we could slide out a little bit, and we were getting those coho and steelhead, which made our June fishing this year really good. Which sometimes in June up this way, our fishing can be a little tough. But that so the diversity of that having a number of kings, which is what everybody wants to catch but we can only have so many and the thing with the kings anymore is that it seems like our water's so clear you get a short window in the morning so when that window is over unless the water's warm and they're deep then you can catch them catch them throughout the day but when they're in shallow and that water's clear it, it shuts off quickly and if we didn't have them coho and steel and lake trout to slide out to we'd slide out a half mile, three quarters of a mile, and we'd start getting coho and steelhead. And so it made a great all day fishery versus you have a phenomenal hour. Gotcha. And then, then you're twiddling your thumbs. If we didn't have the lake trout to fall back on or which is super nice of the coho up here now, that was great to, to fill in the bag with those. Okay. So. Well, so, and what are some things that you you kind of see in the fishery that you're kind of worried about that maybe the last three to five years, you, you know, a trend that you're kind of, you know, maybe not so thrilled about? I would have to say, uh, going with what Adam had said as far as for the, the way the management is, you know, they did a great job of it not collapsing like it did over in Lake Huron. They, you know, basically saved it, which is a kudos to Jay Wesley and the crew. But you got to look at it and say, okay, there comes a time when you got to start putting those kings back in and you know we know that there's politics involved with everything um the consent decree obviously has been a great thing you know to get us through this fishery but now that's come up for renewal in their negotiations and such so you know it kind of worries me about hey what's going to happen there um because there's not a lot of information out about it because there is you know confidentiality agreements and you know we don't have that information to, to find out and you know there's a coalition to protect michigan's resources which is a great place to go to find the truth of what's going on but we got to find out what what's happening because you know we want kings but there's things that have to be done for all parties for this shared resource so that's something we got to make sure that we uh, stay on top of yeah it's i mean everybody wants kings everybody wants you know that's what they want to catch they're exciting to catch there's nothing you know coho doesn't make 400 yard runs doesn't happen kings do that and and uh but at the same point kings are very picky about what they eat um you know they they won't hold in an area where there isn't bait um where you know cohos will move offshore they'll eat bugs steelhead and same thing they'll eat alwives if alwives are around they'll eat bugs if they're not they'll eat you know um you have uh lake trout that are eating gobies they're eating sculpin if there are sculpin you know they're eating bloater chubs whatever they're not and they're going to be kind of in the same area you know you put lake trout you have lake trout in luddington like the the trout don't really move very far you know you have them at pound water they're they're just not they're not a fish that's going to move 20 miles overnight or in a week um where the kings are 
more of that pelagic fish that is, you know, chase or chasing that suspended bait fish and wherever that bait fish goes, that's where they're going to go. Um, so it's, you have to have a balance. And I think that they've really understand the balance better now. Um, you know, unfortunately with everything, the negotiations that are going on, it's, it's not transparent at all. So there's a lot of misinformation, I think that's especially on social media and, um, the coalition is a good place to get good information. Um, Jay, Jay Wesley, I mean, he can't talk about a lot of things because of the, the agreements that are in place, but you know, my hat's off to him because he takes a beating on social media and he tries to put out good information. That's truthful information and, and tries to, you know, explain to the best of his ability what's going on. I wouldn't want to do that. That job would be uh, pretty thankless. And But I think people should really, you know, I challenge people to, to gather truthful information and be involved in these coalitions. If you believe in your fishery, be involved in your sport fishery in your area. Um, you know, if you want to make a difference in the fishery, be involved, you know. One, one thing I always said that, It'd be nice if the DNR would do, which I'm not, I think the DNR, you know, they saved our fishery. We still have a world-class fishery with what we have, even even at the low, which we're pretty fortunate in our area of the lake that we have some great rivers to put us some fish when they weren't putting them in. And I think our numbers in this general area might be skewed to what actually seen in the other part of the lake because we have a great, great section here to fish. But I would, like myself, who I'm out there, you know, 200 times a year and the full time, why don't we ever get a call from the DNR or the biologist? Ask us what we are seeing. You know, I always wondered why, why don't they ask us, which we're out there every day to see what's going on. Why, why don't we ever get a phone call to ask, why, what are we seeing? What do you think? You know, because what better to who to ask than the people are out there every day you know and the uh then like i said that i'm not bashing the dnr I, like i said they saved our fishery as far as i'm concerned but they just need to keep it a diverse fishery so if if something comes back like bkd again and something happens to the kings we got coho and steelhead and lake trout to fall back on if something the lamprey or something happens to the lake trout crash we have kings and coho and steelhead you know less our September, late September, early October fishing last year offshore was phenomenal. I mean, best I've seen in 20 years. I mean, you could go offshore and, and catch pretty much as many steelhead as you wanted to catch. I mean, the conditions were perfect. We we had a bunch of north wind, set the water up, and we had a great break. And, I mean, it was you could find a mile stretch and go back and forth and just catch fishes all day. I mean, it was crazy. It uh, The last – it was like our – best charters of the year the beginning of the year we were catching 30 fish every day down south and then at the end of the year right before we pulled the boat you're we catching 30 fish a day Jeez. i mean it was it was just a and great start and a great finish and there was like not i mean we were out there yeah and that was it there was nobody else no there was like nobody really? there yeah. huh. and, no. it, it, and the conditions were nice like he said you know the the wind the, we got the right wind to set the water up which we mean like um to get uh, the thermal climb or the cold water to to sit right in the water column you know 50 60 foot right where it's pretty targetable and then uh and then it laid down flat yeah for like hmm. a week and a half oh man it was just it was like flat <laughs> smooth water nice. foggy that was about the only yeah. bad part <laughs> fishing but, was phenomenal I, but i think to add to what both of them said that people have got to realize like brent just said they got to talk to us well i'm on the lake michigan citizen advisory committee and you know i relay that to them and the thing that we have to understand is that the political aspect of, you know, we, we, want, we want more kings. Well, okay, we can do it with biology, but there's other things that enter in that we have to plant so many lake trout and we have to do these things. And that is important to be then informed. And I think that's where people fall short. They mm -hmm. don't want to get involved. Yeah. And what I see personally, uh, in my opinion, is that when – us younger guys, and I happen to be the oldest guy here at the table today, unfortunately. But by, you, by know, a, you know, long ways. Yeah, I know. By a long way. I don't Adam. know. We'd have to Appreciate pull out that. The driver's licenses. <laughs> but um, with that being said, you know, when we try to get involved, I know there's like in some of the organizations they got some older folks, and you know, the, the old guards trying to hang on, and you know, the young guys are trying to get in there. The young guys really need to get involved. They need to step up, and like Brent said, need to ask him because he's out there every day. You know, 200 plus days. Adam and myself, you know, you're out there all the time to get that feedback so they can see you know hey 
the electronics we have now aren't like what it was back when we started with the old paper stylus graphs. These electronics are pretty pretty accurate, and uh, you know we see a lot a lot of bait out there, and it's interesting how it runs up and down the coast. So it's important to do that. Now, what about uh, stocking? Um, do you think kind of just give me your thoughts on how impactful is the stocking program here in Michigan? Where do you, are we? doing a good job of that bad job of that i'd love to hear your thoughts on on just the whole well, stocking in general I, I think um you know the in ludington they so we have the pier marquette river um probably one of the largest natural reproduction rivers uh and and pant water benefits from it we also I think have we benefit from it almost more than more than do. we do i think they I think stage they do. down more our way and yeah. then mm-hmm. they go up and go in but that's all right it's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it doesn't bother you <laughs> yeah. Um, you call us all the time to let us know that yeah, they're I call there. you every yeah, time yeah. we get a bite. Yeah, it's kind of strange. <laughs> Sometimes there's a big cell phone block. It's like uh, it just we don't have really good service transmission. Down. <laughs> Our cell phones tend to have a little bit of issue down. But there if sometime. we ever send transmission, like wow, we're getting them at the project. All of a sudden, He's right here there. comes a 36 tier uh, right up the shore. <laughs> well, that one got through. Yeah. But anyways, <laughs> anyways, so. Um, you know, when they caught the, our king plants in Lexington, I don't think we planted kings in seven or eight years. Yeah, I don't think but so. But they they did replace it with cohos, and we have had a coho fishery that's non-existent really in Lexington. We used to get a push. There's a lot of cohos that end up in um, Frankfurt area and uh, Platte Bay, and and but and them fish t- typically go up the wisconsin side and, and come, come across. across after they so leave the southern basin we might they cut across them. and we don't see as many of them we might see them briefly yep. like t- 10 days maybe in the whole season last year brown fishing we were catching cohos small cohos just like you catch in st joe and in michigan city not the numbers but right we were seeing that we caught cohos all year round this year there was days then, in june last year we had 10 to 12 coho on, yeah, a tri- on yep, trips, yep. you know. And that and saves your trip. You oh, know? Yeah. You're gonna so how long have they been stocking coho then around here? They started that right away. Yeah, they started okay. that when they started because basically there's a ratio on the stocking. You put a, you know, a king equivalent. So a king is, you know, kings a one. Of five, yeah, or, kings at five. Because they say, let's say king's a five. Well, then you go to a coho is really a two. So you can plant, you know, two and a half, two, a, two and a half you know, fish for that. Or I'm, I'm, no, I'm not exact. We'd have to look at the exact numbers. But, you know, the king eats the most. So it's, you know, one. And then maybe you can plant, say, three coho to one king or five steelhead to one king and and so forth and so on but like they're talking about these coho you know we've got the Ludington Charter Boat Association that does a net pen out of the state park and I want to say it's like 30 to 40,000 fingerlings that they put in to then release so that's helping feed that natural resource to just you know come back into the you know our different uh, rivers that we have and and start feeding it but the the stocking as a whole you know they had to pull back because of the decline we didn't want to have a you know a lake here on situation and now that we're back and everybody's like you know put more kings put more kings well you know it's a delicate fishery out there yeah we don't want to overdo it because all you have is one bad year of weather or class of eel wives and you know we're you know, in another bad situation. So it's the, the stocking is vital to answer that question. Diversity okay. is yeah. where it's at. Yeah, diversity is where it's at, but you got to have the stocking. And that's what it's stocking. supposed to be yeah. for their yeah. long-range goal. And, okay. the, and the fact that, you know, when we do plant these fish, you got to plant enough at a spot so that they'll hold. You know, basically, I know uh, Jay said like 100,000 is what you need to plant in an area. So while they may plant, say, 100,000 down in St. Joe and then jump up to the Grand or wherever, you know, it doesn't make any sense to just throw 30,000 here or there. Our coho, on the other hand, is different. The kings, you got to have the the numbers. Yeah. So, you know, stocking is critical for our fishery. Yeah, I mean, you, if you you know, we're re- very reliant on natural reproduction. There's a lot of variables to natural reproduction that can hinder one an entire year class. You know, if you have eggs get silted in, so you have um, spawning fish, spawning in gravel, and then right after that, you have high water. You get, you know, silt and debris that's going to silt those eggs into to the, to the rocks, and, and that kind of, that's it. That year class is gone. So so it, I think there's definitely a balance between natural fish and, uh, and planted fish, and I think the planted fish are more consistently, you know, you're going to have these at least this amount of fish every year, and then whether or not natural reproduction. Is there any is idea how many, the percentage of those stockings that actually live through the whole process i think it's 10 percent. yeah you're, you're, you're at 10 percent. that's why that hundred thousand is it's is, is so critical okay. you know the ones that actually make it to maturity is you know is small yep. you yeah. know you know whether it's you know natural predation you know catching oh, them yeah. or whatever so well and that's a consideration too is if so say you take ten thousand salmon and you release them right you have this exact so 
you have all these predator fish that are going to feed and birds that are going to feed on this fish right away. Yeah. And there's X amount of those predators. Well, each predator can only eat so much and then the rest would get by. So if you only plant 10,000 fish, they could all be eaten by predators and you would have no return. Where if you planted a hundred thousand, mm. then you would have 90,000 make it past the predators okay. at least to have a chance. So it, it is important. And that, but then there's a lot of political pressure like, well, you know, here we, we need to have our fish and we need, well, we'll give you 25,000. Well, it's, not You'd be better off to save the 25,000 from four ports and put them in one port okay. than you would be to put 25,000 in four ports. Yeah, do they stack down in Pentwater? We've never, Pentwater's never been stocked for, sand, for okay. you know, for kings as and, far as I know. And the Pure Marquette River has never been stocked for kings either. They <laughs> plant at the Sobble. So it's okay. not, you know, that, ri- you know, that is a natural reproduction. And river. I think that's what, that's what helps us so much. Yep. We get. Surprisingly, Pentwater is a little river. It gets a pretty good run, yep. and especially for steelhead. And so between the Pier Marquette and the Pentwater being naturals, that, that I believe helps us quite, a, quite significantly in our area. And just so. to add to that, if, like they were saying, if you plant the kings in Medusa Creek, it's just a little, little spot. But for whatever reason, the kings work really, really well there for you know, natural reproduction and planting. If you plant those fish up north, like Brent was talking about, they make a whole pass. So they'll go down to the southern end of the lake, and then they'll work their way back up. So everybody gets a shot at those kings as they mm. move north, which is huge. So, you know, why plant, say, 25,000 down here or 25,000 there? Put them at a spot that you know is going to, you know, benefit the entire lake from. I mean, okay. they'll go across to Wisconsin and, and everything. So you got to feed the ones that are, uh, are going to keep the fishery going. And you guys might, might not know the answer to this question, but because we did a story earlier this year, on the stocking out of Grand Haven, and they had the net pens there and all the stuff, and but they ended up with like an extra hundred thousand or some crazy amount. It was like, so, what uh, happened? How COVID, does that happen? During COVID, um, they did not the 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 spring of of COVID, they did not do a harvest of steelhead eggs, and so they didn't have the fit. You know, the the hatchery didn't produce steelhead that year, so they could not release those. So it, to replace the steelhead that would have been released in the predator ratio, they put kings. And those kings, those steelhead would have been planted, I probably, uh, been in the northern Manistee, uh, different areas. But because we have this, the tribal decree, um, they didn't want to plant the kings in tribal water. So they were they, they, in waters affected by the decree. I'm yeah. trying to walk the line here. <laughs> what? Um, so the the way that they could plant those fish without it being a direct violation or being maybe being um, negative to the um, uh, to their to the well the, basically what it came down to is in order to plant in tribal waters you have to go to the um, the, the, the tribe all parties. and all parties have to agree to it if they want to plant out of tribal waters which is you know basically south. I forget the exact location, but it's basically south of Muskegon okay. is where the treaty waters are north. So that's uh, how forward. they could put those fish there. So they could put those there. fish yeah. there and not have to go there and ask that question. Now, that, again, goes to what you know Adam's yeah. talking about. You're walking that line because, well, if we can add kings, why can't we add you know more trout or more whitefish or things along those lines? Because that's what they, you know, what they want up north or whatever or let them catch that. It's a, it's, it, it goes back to yeah. that balance of that ratio of how many kings they can put in. And there, there's, a, there, there's a, tons of misinformation, that, especially on social media. Um, and people are always saying, you know, why don't they plant bait? But it doesn't – if they took all of the hatchery resources that they have and they planted – they raised nothing but LYs and they released it, it would feed the kings and the predator fish for like one day. Hmm. So the the bait has to be able to sustain itself. That's why it was important to reduce okay. the predator level, let hmm. the bait recover. If the bait can't sustain itself, you can't just keep adding food. You know, okay. it has to. Yeah, it's a big fishbowl. It's, it's like been, when you're a kid and you had an awesome aquarium and then you went to the store and you thought, oh, this Oscar would fit in there so good. <laughs> and you threw it in there and it ate everything and then the yeah. Oscar died. So it's, pro- it's kind of interesting that stocking is so crucial. I mean, yeah. I think maybe people don't realize, well, it's a it's a huge lake and a what does it matter if they throw in 10,000 or – but you're saying it really affects everything. And it affects things for a lot of years. Right. Yeah. If you throw, you know, half a million kings in, they're in there for four years. 
And then they're going to reproduce. Yeah. And whatever ratio of that reproduction happens. So now you've made an, you've made an adjustment, a large adjustment to this fishery that is going to probably have a lasting effect for at least a decade, if not longer. Okay. And the, and lake trout, I mean, I've caught lake trout that were 25, 26, 27 years old. We we Hmm. turned one in a couple of years ago and it was uh, tagged in 86. Yeah. Really? The, they had, uh, I think they've been doing that, um, adipose tagging for somewhat like 30 years now wow and we sent that one in and it came back 1986 huh it was only like a 17 pound fish wow it was so it's pretty amazing if you start to think you know i think browns can live six seven years coho's only live three years um steelhead probably six seven years eight yeah. years maybe till they die okay. till they die yeah <laughs> yeah so, I mean, we've touched a little bit on on the DNR, and I think you guys have said some nice things about them, which is great. I mean, but let's say you were the head honcho for the DNR, and you're the main fisheries guy, and what what would you do differently than – or maybe you wouldn't do anything differently, but if you were king for a day and you got to pick, what would you guys – how would you change what's happening in the in the in Lake Michigan? I I don't think that's an easy question. <laughs> I just, I, that I would seemed probably, easy enough. I'd probably put in my papers for my two-week notice. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I would retire at that day. Yeah, I think. Well, I, I it's a tough quit. job, There's, and it's easy. To, it's easy to bash a DNR, but like you said, yeah. they've done a good job of main, you know, keeping the fishery going. And so, I mean, maybe they're maybe they're doing a great job. I'm not. You know. I think that it's it's really unfortunate the amount that politics play hmm. in stocking. Okay. And, and, and it has to do with, there's a lot of different people with their hand in the pie yeah. and, um, be it different States, be it different organizations. Um, there's a lot of different things. And I think that if you, I believe in science, like I'm not a denier of yeah. science. Um, I don't, I think science changes constantly. So, um, especially like uh, assessing bait populations and stuff. If you make a mistake, you want to be on the safe side. That's for sure. But Mm. at the same point, I think that there's people that have their hand in the pie that don't care about the fishery. And it's really unfortunate. Uh, I'm not going to like, yeah, you know, overly divulge in that, but you know, I think there needs to be some accountability for, for different groups. And, Mm. you know, there's questions that should be answered that don't get answered. And it's really unfortunate. (laughs) One thing I think the, general public needs to realize is like when an officer comes up to him that officer isn't the one making those decisions Mm -hmm. they they're the ones that in that interact with the public and they get the blunt of all the complaints when they got nothing to there's they have no say in what's going on so if if one of the officer comes and stops you to check you you can't really blame him for the fishery i mean if you don't like what they're doing it's he doesn't have any more say in in it than than we do so well, I, w- I would just add that again the politics that come into play i wholeheartedly believe that the the stockings um because of the science and the data we could have gone more if they want to say they're going to err on the side of caution but you know we're in the midst of negotiating the 2020 consent decree that expired well you know we're going on two and a half years there's a status conference coming up in march that they're like hey what's what's happening well you know we don't know what's happening and because of the confidentiality. And, you know, I, I think that they didn't increase the plants even more because of the politics. And, you know, to answer your question directly, if I was king for a day, I would sit there and say, we made it through this, you know, almost, you know, crash that could have happened like Lake Huron. The science worked. The decree that we had in place worked. It's a shared resource. Just leave it there. Let's just move forward with it and then get the transparency out there. And that's what I think is is missing but that would be awesome just to say hey look back because we have people that have negotiated this thing from the beginning <laughs> let's just put them in place and let them do their do their job and be done with it okay well so with the amount of knowledge you guys have and your years of fishing and i think you know other charter boat guys kind of have their system and their setup and whatnot but let's let's think of the guy that uh, maybe gets out you know half a dozen to a dozen times a year he's got a you know 16 to 20 some foot boat and he's going to run four or five lines let's say and let's put you in that position. You guys are running, what, 14, 16, 17, 17 lines at a time? <laughs> 20. Which we need to talk about how you don't get tangled. Well, I know you get tangled once in a while. But, but for the guy that's going to go out and he's going to put four rods, it's maybe him and a buddy in there. They don't, wanna, they don't have the ability to run six, eight, ten rods. And let's put them, you know, sometime from, you know, spring to fall, and they're going to go out. What would you recommend for that guy? Would you say hey, get some downriggers? Would you say dipsies? Would you say long lines? Like, what, what would you do? So, so – Mark and I, so I have a, a captain's roundtable similar to this that I do 
and uh, post on YouTube. Um, and Mark and I have had pretty in-depth conversations on this, on that specific topic. So I think there's a couple different things. Salmon fishing um, knowledge is very important. Information is more important than knowledge. Like you need to have information. And social media contains a tremendous amount of of information. So on those days when you're not fishing, you should always be gathering a little bit of information, paying attention to the wind, um, especially wind directions, um, because that will make water cool off or warm up. It will make sh the fish will shift because of the water temperature changes, which, you know, the bait moves as well. Um, but creating a network, and we talked about this a lot, and the network is like all of us, we all fish, we all communicate, we share information. So if you are fishing by yourself with no network, no people to talk to, no information coming in, the only information you're getting is your ex exact knowledge, you know, your exact experience, you know, where I can go out and I'm hitting fish really good and, and Brent, well, he's hitting fish and then stops hitting fish and he'll call us and he'll say, Hey, you know, did you guys see something change? Did you see this? And we're like, yeah, and then that helps him. You know, he gets information. Plus, how many guys in Pentwater do you talk to? And you're all fishing the same water. So that that having a good relationship with other boats, and be it charter boats, be it amateur boats, you see a guy at the at the launch, and you introduce yourself, you know, at 5 in the morning and say, hey, let's, let's talk at 8.30 and exchange numbers, and we'll just compare notes and see if one of us can put, you know, help the other out. So we try to... Um, you know, really promote this network thing. Gotcha. Now that's kind of off topic of what you asked, but I think that's more important than what you asked. As well, far that, as that's being a good, successful. that's a good, yeah, that's, I mean, that would be an ideal situation, yeah. but let's say you, you don't have, you know, you're going to load your kids up and a buddy and you're going to go up to Frankfurt, you know, and yep. you're going to, you're going to fish Saturday because that's the day you got, you know, what would you tell that guy? Like what, what would be a, just a, if you were going to do that and you didn't have, you're, you're kind of going in blind a little bit. What's a, what can that guy do to ca maybe catch I'd some fish? Set two downriggers, two divers, and two boards to start with to see what. And then as it, it'd be hard if he doesn't have all the different setups yeah. to target what the water conditions are. But, I mean, if you got a flat, bright day, you you might unless you're fishing trout on the bottom, throw your riggers in the boat and run a couple divers and four boards or something. You know, okay. through, throughout the year, it's we catch more fish on our boards than – probably anything but we usually have 10 boards out there and four divers and three riggers so the numbers are yeah. are there but on uh, especially when the water the temperature is up higher and uh, especially on bright days i mean your boards are going to outproduce pretty much everything so would you tell like so let's say somebody doesn't have a couple down riggers but they you know would you would you say get some dipsies or or would you do lead core or would you do so, copper or so a, a a dipsy diver, um, you can have two different setups they can run on exactly the same rod, a deep setup and a, and a shallower setup. Um, you can run those at any depth. Where a lead core, if you have a 10 color, which is 100 yards of lead segmented line, it's going to fish at 40 feet. It doesn't matter what you do. You could reel it in a little bit to make it fish shallower, but then you can't put it on a board. Um, so it, if you're going to have only a couple setups, you're better, to, I think, to have uh, setups that are adjustable. It's so like downriggers. You can fish a downrigger. With an electric downrigger, you can fish from three feet below the water column to 350 feet below the water column or and anywhere in between, and you can quickly make adjustments. But like uh, Brent was saying, you know, if I was going to go out blind, if I had any knowledge, I would hope that it would be where the temperature change is in the water column. So if you just – but say you didn't know that and it's August and you're going to assume that the water is probably at 70 feet. So I'm going to run a 300 copper, a 400 copper and two divers and two downriggers. And I'm going to put everything where I think that change is. And I'm going to stagger it from 50 feet down to 80 feet. I'm going to try and cover. Now, if I start getting bit on my 300 copper, uh, I know that my 300 copper is going to fish right around 60 feet. So then I'm going to maybe bring a downrigger up to 60 feet or 55 and I'm going to take a, a, a low diver and I'm going to let it out a hundred and you know 80 feet to, or 160 feet to get it in that 80 foot range and I'm just going to keep adjusting 
I think what we do that makes us catch a lot of fish is we put a ton of baits right in where they're biting. You know, there's specific water ch- chunks of the water column, but it will change every day. Yeah. If the wind shifts out of the north for two days, it, the water is totally different. Where you're going blind again. Yeah. So it's like having that knowledge, um, but keeping good notes too. You know, if you're fishing, you go out, you say, hey, the water's 71 degrees. Today it's August, whatever, and we're going to fish Frankfurt. And you can look back from a couple of years ago where you did similar time, similar weather conditions and say, well, you know, we had a double glow plug on a, on a 10 color that was working. We had a rotator on a 300 copper that was working. Those are, that's where you start, you know. But to go back to what Jimmy was asking as far as for, you know, hey, mom and dad are jumping in the car, dad and his boys and another dad and his boys are going, you know, first thing to do your thing, check your knowledge, check the bait shops, check the internet Mm -hmm. to just get some ideas. Next thing is, is you sit there, if you know some charter boats that are in the area, um, take a look and see where they're going, you know, don't sit there and be fleas and jump on our back. Not all you charter know. boats. And these are Ludington know. guys. Tell, <laughs> I would follow sportsmen <laughs> charters. <laughs> they come down and they find us and they just go bloop. Exactly, because we don't know the area, so we find the charter boat down there, which is sportsmen, and we jump on top of them. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they'll go right between me and Trevor and say, oh. "Well, you know, let me ask you this." We got this... a beacon on his boat. It blinks on my GPS. He flat ass told me the other day that when he comes down there, he locks me on his radar. <laughs> So we can I get my troll and my speed. Now, <laughs> as a so as a charter boat captain, because this is something I think a lot of people do. I, I know I've done it in Florida before, not so much up here, but you know you go out with a charter boat captain and learn how to fish that stretch yeah, of water, absolutely. and then you go get your boat. Is that as a charter boat I, guy? Does that are you like yeah? That's we we prefer, we provide that service, or is it like oh I can't believe because you might see that guy next to you the next day? It's it's not a problem until they you sit there and they jump on top of you and they won't let you move. You know, okay. um, one of my things I've got a. I'm a member of the Detroit area steelheaders, and I'll, you know, I get phone calls. Hey, Mark, what are they doing? What are they doing? Um, my rule is, I will tell you everything and let you know where we're at. Just, you know, when you come out there, be courteous. You know, like Brent said, you know, we come down there and, and, and block in. Well, no, you sit there, you can say, okay, Brent's in this area. We know we're in the area where the fish are, and you can communicate if you got a slide. The other thing is, is that. You know, match what they're doing. If you sit there and you look and you see the sportsmen's and you see, you know, the different uh, charter boats, Silver Addiction, and they're all at a certain angle, you might want to be on that angle because they're catching fish. And that goes to what Brent said because this happened to me a couple years ago. I came down, you know, we're running our north-south troll down there, and I'm like, man, I'm not catching fish. And, you know, he, him and Trevor are catching fish. And all of a sudden I get a text that says east-west is best. And I looked and I went, shoot he is going east west and i'm going north south i turn east west and all of a sudden everything started going so you know you kind of match that troll you know and to see exactly what's happening you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah when his phone goes dead you know it's really bad so then that's when i just figured you know what i'll go down there i'll find him i'll lock him with radar i can get his troll direction and everything and not have to bug him you know as far as that goes but as far as for like setups and stuff make it to where you're flexible make it to where you know what i used to do way back before i got to the bigger boats and such and couldn't carry as many much equipment i think there's 60 some reels around here to be gone through but i would take that like he said with the lead cores get a three five seven ten setup and then you can always let all the lead out and then put a pinch weight on it so you can change the depth. So now I don't have to have, like, we've got two, threes, fours, fives, and all those. You can adjust your depth to go where you need to be, look at your water clarity. Then to what Brent said as far as for, you know, we run more boards than we do um, d- uh, divers or riggers. You know, I've got a 38 sitting here with almost a 15-foot beam, and I run three down riggers. When I started with my father, it was five to six riggers. It's a big difference. So, you know, I would go, I would go with lead core. It's cheaper, easier to run, and less, more forgiving. And when you guys run, divers. whether it's six rods or 15 rods, where are your – are they deep on the outside or deep close to the boat, and then they shallowest go – Shallowest on shall- the outside. Shallowest so on the outside. So you're basically doing like this with your boards. So your shallow running board will be all the way out, and your deep one first board out. Okay. So, so it's like this. So when you bring that fish in, you're, you're coming over top of all the In theory, it should theory. swing back and go across. <laughs> in, 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 theory, in, theory. in theory, the fish grabs the bait, and it will begin to rise and go to the center from the drag. Okay. So one key to running that many rods is don't ever stop. If you ah. stop, you're going to have a problem. Some guys will, small boats, they'll fish the pier heads, they'll hook a fish, they stop. Ah. That's fine if you have three rods out. Unless okay. you're right in front of you. Unless you're right in front of you. <laughs> That's not fine That's at not all. Good. No. <laughs> but best, does anybody have a best tangle story? Oh. That was, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> to I, go back to the, to the 
question before before you go on. Yeah. The, I think the biggest, the beginning people, their biggest, they're probably the thing they do wrong is they need to learn, especially up in our water where there's current, they need, need yeah. to know which direction to troll. Yeah. Troll direction is by far Everything. The, the most important. There, there's days we go down our bank and you're popping fish and you don't turn around and the customer says, well, we, why aren't we going back there? I said, well, we can, but we won't catch. I mean, I know by what the feel of the troll is and your fish hawk and everything. That if I turn around, we're probably not going to catch nothing. So we'll waste an hour trolling back and turn around. Now you just killed an hour going back to that spot to try to repeat your troll. And, and those fish might not even be there no more. You know, where if you were to kept going for an hour, you pro if a straight line troll is when the current tells you to do that. You know, if if you're going in a direction and everything's pulling right and you're catching fish, you really don't want to turn around. Unless, I mean, sometimes you have to because you run out of fish. But if you can feel it in your troll, if if uh, you don't want to turn around because yeah. they just won't, you won't get them. And if I mean, you're, won't bite. if you're, if you have downriggers and your downriggers are like this, you know, we're going straight and your downriggers are like this, you're not straight. Yeah. Try to, you know, if you're, if you're in Ludington and you're north by the point and you're trolling on a zero degree north troll, I guarantee you are not straight because the current never runs that way. It always runs on 15 degree angle or whatever. And the same thing in pot water, the way that the water collides, we have like uh, underwater sand dunes and the water collides into the sand dune and then it's, it starts to follow it. So to find those points where it collides is, is okay. usually a beneficial thing, but Okay, so let's uh, just kind of wrap things up as we look for, you know, this this upcoming spring all the way to fall. Kind of walk me through what a spring fishing look like for you guys, uh, all the way dead of summer to fall, and what do you kind of what are you hoping to see this next year? Uh, go ahead, go yeah, ahead, so whoever well, wants to start, yeah. <laughs> mine's going to be a little different than theirs with with starting out down south. So we'll start down there first week of April. Um, typically, it's phenomenal fishing. The fishery down there is numbers wise is great you're Typically, talking st joe area st uh, new buffalo michigan city okay st joe um a lot of numbers of fish we don't get our tend to get the size of fish early that you do you know later in the year but a lot of action uh, a lot of 30 fish days and then um last year it was great down there the spring fish the spring king fishery wasn't that good because it was the whole lake kind of warmed up together and the fish were we were getting a few kings down there and my mother boat in Pentwater was getting a few kings here and Manistee was getting some kings. So the spring king fishery wasn't good, but it was phenomenal fishing. But so then we'll, you know, I expect that to be good again. Um, I would expect we get back to Pentwater. It should last year, all the signs, good bait. We had a decent amount of fish. Mm -hmm. So size was great. So I guess for I see would be the pretty much a repeat of last year. I, I don't foresee any big changes this year. I mean, when do things start to so you have the early fishing and then when does the summer like what happens in like Juneish? So in in Ludington um in Pentwater area uh generally you start, you know, mid middle of April. Um it's pretty the water's pretty cold. You're usually right about freezing. So you don't necessarily have a lot of uh really active fish around, but we'll be catching uh browns and and cohos last year uh and then some lake trout and as the water begins to warm up um the lake trout fishing really takes off and we have pretty solid lake trout fishing all phenomenal. the way all phenomenal the way spring into lake trout fishing june late june once you start getting some <clears throat> some warming of the water to where you start getting some uh temperature breaks on the surface offshore then you start seeing you know you'll start to see some steelhead some cohos out there um and juvenile fish uh lake trout suspended and that fishery lasts really well. I mean, we do get a push of kings that come through, um, usually sometime end of May, beginning of June. And then we usually, in Ludington, we usually see a return of the kings about the third, second to third week of uh, July. Okay. And then we have pretty solid uh, fishing all the way to September of with kings. And we're targeting mainly kings. And then after the, the kings start to slow down, um, you can still catch the juvenile fish are just out usually a little bit deeper. You start fishing 10, 15 miles offshore mm. and 
you see steelhead and light trout suspended again and, and juvenile kings sometimes still some random you know large kings uh lots of cohos lots of mature cohos which are a riot to catch uh very hard on tackle but we had some very awesome fun to coho catch yeah. size last year the coho we had in august were phenomenal size unbelievable like and if you are one who likes to eat salmon uh, of all the salmon the coho is by far the best table wow. pair okay uh, and they're fun to catch and yeah. it's exciting because you usually don't hit one you hit two or three or four or five all at nice. once just boom five fish huh. on yeah i so. think that you're i think the other thing is is that i think there's going to be some big big kings around oh I yeah mean, i don't think we're you know that shouldn't we, change we, yeah i mean maybe not setting state records but i think we're going to have some you know 30 pounders that are going to get in there and the nice part about that is is that it does give you that thrill and that tug of the drug as they say but you know that coho and the steelhead i'm excited to go back offshore have that offshore fishery with the coho but mm -hmm. then the steelhead because there were some steelhead that you know that didn't Phenomenal. get in the boat that you know you saw out there rocketing in mm -hmm. the air and they were just monsters and there, so there's there got to be a some big of, steelhead out there we haven't seen great steelhead numbers uh really in a few years and last year we had great and this there's this, like the river has been this fall good. and winter so far has been mm -hmm. phenomenal steelhead fishing so i don't think that that's necessarily going to change no. okay. and that you know we don't catch a lot of steelhead out on lake michigan until uh, really until June, but you know, those fish run in the river and, and spawn in the spring and they start to fall out in May. Um, it, so you don't necessarily see those fish out on those, but the, the, it's amazing how quickly they recover when they get back out there and they start eating again. And, nice. And, uh, yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you guys for your time. Yeah. That was thank a lot you. of fun and uh, maybe we'll have to do this again. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Appreciate it.